food as a better than your bios, but um, he, he's going to introduce the other panelists. But I want you to think about this a little bit as a conversation, not necessarily um, polar opposites. So we're going to think and talk about abolition and reform. With that, I think you're going to sign off. Well, thank you very much, Gene. Oh, thank you, Barb. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> clap for me. <laughs> What's up, Matt? How are you doing? <laughs> so I see so many familiar faces in the audience. It's good to be in a community of advocates and people who care deeply uh, about these issues and uh, a community of future advocates, if I can have anything to do with it. A shout out to my daughter, Kalila Hall, hey. senior Cambridge Ringer hey. Latin. Hey. I know, right? Trying to plant some seeds. <laughs> of activism. Uh, so this is a very uh, important conversation and one that I don't think a lot of people are having in a uh, really robust way beyond certain circles. And so that said, I'd uh, like to take an opportunity to uh, kind of read through the bios of our panelists today uh, and then dive right into the, the questions about this uh, conversation of abolition versus reform or abolition and reform. Uh, and then certainly leave some time at the end for for uh, some questions. So our uh, first panelist to my far right is Reverend Jason Lydon. He is a Unitarian Universalist community minister and the national director of Black and Pink, an open family of LGBTQ prisoners and free world allies. Yes, give it up for Black and Pink. Yes, Jason spent the last decade following his incarceration working with the LGBTQ prisoners, doing advocacy, organizing, and power building as part of the movement to abolish the prison industrial complex. Jason has published multiple articles on prison abolition with a focus on the impact of sexual violence on prisoners and is currently a part-time lecturer in the Crime and Justice Studies Department at UMass Dartmouth, Reverend Jason Leiden. And to my immediate right, the Honorable Leslie Harris has been an Associate Justice in the Suffolk County Juvenile Court in Massachusetts since 1994. Prior to his appointment, uh, he was the Chief of the Juvenile Division at the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office. He has also worked as a public defender for the Committee for Public Counsel Service from 1988 to 1992, and as a probation officer for three years. He served as a probation officer in Suffolk Superior Court and was a licensed social worker. Uh, Judge Harris uh, was also a program consultant for the Museum of Afro-American History in Boston, the director of Melrose Medco program where he established an administered busing program for students of color uh, from inner city communities. He taught at Roxbury Community College, Edco Metro Pathways program, Highland Park Fees School, Free School, New School for Children, and Salem State College and University of Massachusetts in Boston. He is also a youth worker, uh, had formerly a youth worker in working with Chicago street gangs. Uh, he retired uh, from the bench in 2014, Judge Leslie Harris. And, I, you know, I, I think I'd be remiss if I, I didn't point out that as a former uh, prosecutor, now reformed and civil rights activist, <laughs> um, I used to have cases in front of Judge Harris. And as prosecutors, we hated Judge Harris. <laughs> We had not personally hated him, but for the sake of our work, we didn't like going in front of him because we felt that the objective that we were trying to reach, which was lock these kids up, and it wasn't that blatant. It was more, we need this, the juvenile justice system to bring about reform in the lives of these young people. Uh, but Judge Harris had a different perspective on that, and it wasn't about holding kids. It wasn't about keeping them in cages, uh, and he was very concerned and interested in the lives of these young people, and that was something uh, that I, you know, as an African American prosecutor, certainly appreciated and, uh, you know, really had to work to convince some of my colleagues that what he was doing and the perspective he had was an appropriate one. Uh, so, that said, I want to dive into some of these questions. And uh, Reverend Lydon, uh, you know, I think a lot of people, uh, maybe not the people in here, but for the sake of those who go out into the world and do advocacy and have family and friends, uh, are, are skeptical uh, about uh, the idea of, uh, of prison abolition or even police abolition. And so how would you describe or explain this movement of, of abolition and how they work and why it's important? 
Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, and I'm really excited to be here, also recognizing so many great faces. And Sophia, it's so nice to see you here. Uh, yes, I sure can. Sorry about that. I think the first thing about abolition is that it is a value statement. The value statement of the movement within abolition is that human beings have the potential to do great and good things, and human beings have the potential to do terrible and awful things. And that we recognize that in all people. And that abolition has an understanding of power, that people are uh, often held accountable for the harm and violence that they do when uh, they don't have as much access to institutional power, whereas people with greater institutional power are never held accountable for the harm that they cause. And that is true both in our lens of capitalism in terms of corporations and empires. Uh, it's also true in interpersonal relationships where we look at the ways in which uh, people who are in abusive romantic relationships, the person with power in that relationship is almost never held accountable for the harm that they are causing. And so abolition is about coming up with new solutions that aren't relying on punishment and retaliation and retribution. It's about coming up with real solutions that are addressing the realities of harm and violence. And I think a key to abolition is understanding out of the abolitionist lens that the prison system can't be reformed because it's not broken. That the prison system does exactly what it is intended to do. That it locks up and destroys the lives of those that society considers disposable, undesirable, expendable, and specifically going after black and brown people, people with disabilities, LGBTQ folks. And that abolition is about figuring out ways that we support the communities who have been directly targeted by the prison industrial complex to figure out and create new ways of dealing with justice and harm uh, in a radically different way of doing things. Thank you. So Judge Harris, I noticed a, a, a physical reaction to Jason's statement that the prison system is not broken, uh, despite the, the contextualization that he gave in that it's doing what it was intended to do. Given your experience as someone who has worked in the criminal justice system and seen it uh, up close and personally, and, and even the interactions that you've had with the criminal justice system in your personal life through, uh, through family, uh, what are the reforms that you see that are necessary that could make this, uh, what some would say, broken system work right? Well, first off, thanks for including me in this discussion. Um, I don't disagree mm -hmm. with Jason. Um, taking the term abolition, you know, of course, that's a personal um, statement in my history, but I'm also realistic. And I would love to see us abolish prisons. But in the meantime, I think we have to correct prisons. We have to change prisons. Um, most of my legal career has been in the juvenile court. And, but I've also been a mentor up at Norfolk Prison for 20 some years. And um, at some point I was over at the um, Bridgewater, not Bridge, yeah, Bridgewater, the sexually dangerous unit. Mm -hmm. um, used to mentor up there also. And one of the things that I recognize is some of the most talented, brightest, capable men that I know are in these boxes. And we're wasting them. We're wasting their potential in the system as it now exists. We take people, no matter what they're charged with, if they're convicted of a felony, they end up in the same prison. So you have a murderer, you have an embezzler, you have a car thief, um, you have someone who's doing four to five years, someone who's doing life in the same prison. Now one of my um, former mentees, Andre Norman, um, does a TED talk about this. And Andre did um, 14, 15 years in prison. One of the brightest young men that I've known, and he did 14 to 15 years in prison. He was in my youth group at church. And 
I listen to him. I listen to him because he has lived the experience. And what he talks about is that very fact that we have people who are doing different times in the same prison, and that doesn't work. What you need to do is to separate people. If you have five years, you should be in a five-year prison. If you have 10 years, you're in a 10-year prison, and then you move to a five-year prison as you do your time. What he talks about is how he became a power broker in prison because he was there long enough to learn how to manipulate, how to control, how to be the man. He's six, three, six, four, big guy, uh, intimidating if he wants to be. And he talks about that. And if we don't change our prisons so that we can educate. Someone said 40% of um, all men in prison. And I'm talking about men because that's been my experience. 40% of all men in prison are functionally illiterate. I disagree. I think it's higher than that. Mm. I spoke out at Norfolk Prison, and I, you know, it's 300 men in the auditorium, and I asked a simple question. How many of you graduated from high school? Now, granted, I put half of them to sleep, so we got 150 men who were paying attention, <laughs> but still there weren't 10 hands that went up, and that's a very clear statement. We have a captive audience. Why not make education the focus? Why not educate folks instead of vegetating them, letting them just sit and do nothing? Educate, you get out early, you know, when you meet certain milestones. We can change how we do this so that when you come out, you're employable. We need to do away with quarries. Now, you want to talk about abolition. Mm -hmm. That's one I believe in. Quarries, once you've done your time and you've paid your price, we're supposed to be through. We're supposed to start fresh, but we don't. Even in the juvenile court, people say, oh, it's just a juvenile record. No. You get a juvenile conviction, that juvenile conviction is there for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Even if you weren't convicted, you have to explain away being in court. And I've had too many young people who were in the wrong court, should not have been there at all, but still have to explain the way for the rest of their lives because they got arraigned while they were in court. See, we need to be able to wipe that out. We need to give people that proverbial second chance. So you, you lifted up three things. One, kind of segregate people by the length of their sentence. Two, invest in education. And um, three, get rid of Corey, which I think are very tangible uh, reforms. Jason, you know, what you're thinking about that as far as you know, abolition being a, a, a value statement, is this something that is transitional? Like, do we do things till we get to a point of, uh, of abolition where there's a total transformation of how we as a society and our criminal justice system is, and you know, are these some of the things that can be done to, to get to that place? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> so I think a couple of responses around that. Uh, first, I, I do think that abolition gets looked at as unrealistic and, I, and impractical, and I think it's really important that as abolitionists we see it as very practical and both a strategy of getting to where we want to go and the end goal. And so uh, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, who's a brilliant uh, abolitionist, scholar, activist, she talks about non-reformist reforms or what other people call abolitionist reform. So that which removes bricks from the system. So it's uh, things that we can engage in, work that we can do, recognizing that there are 2.23 million people in prison, 5 million more on probation or parole, that there is a reality of the carceral state's power just in terms of uh, that type of surveillance. And there's, you know, the many police and people's communities, the surveillance that's going on. So there's much work that can absolutely be done and must be done in the meantime while we are figuring out ways to actually tear down uh, the concrete and steel that is locking our families and loved ones up. 
I think some of those are ones that abolitionists uh, would get absolutely behind. I think Corey abolition would absolutely be an abolitionist reform. It's about taking power away from the system, putting the power back into the community that's been directly affected. I think that would be an essential piece that people would get involved in. Whereas if you look at Corey reform in Massachusetts and what happened in Massachusetts, I would suggest that actually a lot of abolitionists were not very interested in being involved in Corey reform that happened here and the work that happened because if you are having you know, your quarry sealed after five years or 10 years, uh, if you had a misdemeanor and you couldn't get a job in five years, that sixth year is very unlikely that you are also now going, oh, everything should be fine now, so another year later. Uh, and similarly that the uh, movement really threw people convicted of sex offenses under the bus in order to get the win for Corey reform. That there was, you know, at the end of the day, uh, a lot of reform work will happen and get passed at the expense of other people who are seen as less desirable, uh, who are the worst, the bad, the, uh, you know, less deserving prisoners. And that's the same with the like nonviolent versus violent offenders conversation that is constant. Uh, the need to release only drug offenders uh, as opposed to people convicted of other offenses. Uh, so abolitionists would problematize that, would trouble that idea that uh, it is ever okay for us to secure victories at somebody else's expense. And if we're ever doing that, then we are not going to work on that particular campaign. We're not going to work on that effort. And at times, we'll even oppose it. And I think that's, well, for abolitionists and reformists, we need to figure out there are lots of places where we can work together and that we can align and do things with each other in terms of uh, pushing for changes. There are other places where we diverge and we're going to work on separate things and that's okay. But there are also places where we're going to clash and we're going to actually fight and we'll be opposed to each other. I think the education one is one in particular where there's some tension. I think a lot of uh, reform advocates have, been, have pushed for mandatory GEDs while you are incarcerated, mandatory going to classes where it becomes a requirement during your incarceration. Whereas abolitionists appropriately would fight back against that and say education should be offered Education should be an opportunity. Education should be provided so that folks are having uh, the option for themselves to participate in ways that make sense for them during their incarceration, and they should get re rewarded for doing so. However, there should never be a punitive aspect attached to it, which many reformists have passed through in other states across the country. So I think that would be a place where depending on how it's done, there are ways in which that reform can be done that abolitionists would see as a move in the right direction, and others where abolitionists would say, absolutely not, we cannot work on something that is going to give more punitive impacts to folks, uh, and we don't want that to happen. I do just want to touch for a second on people with uh, the classification during incarceration, I think is something that there's a lot of uh, lack of knowledge, I would say, for many of us as abolitionists in terms of how uh, the ways in which people are able to interact while they're incarcerated to survive. Uh, and that people's convictions can't be the uh, only or even primary thing that designates where someone is housed during their incarceration. That a lot of us never get caught for the terrible things that we've done. <laughs> Many of us in this, in this space have hurt and harmed other people and nobody else knows about it except for the person we hurt or harmed. And so the ways in which we do classification for prisoners ignores that. Uh, it ignores the reality of what's happening beyond simply what we're told through people's quarries, through looking at their criminal record. And so I think we need to uh, look at what is going to be safest for everybody while we're getting ourselves to a place where we are not locking everyone up. So in that, in the meantime and in between time, then figuring out what is, uh, what works for everybody, could both of you talk about the way policing impacts uh, incarceration and what a reformed uh, or uh, an abolished criminal justice system, uh, what does policing look like in those types of system where it's either reformed or where there is prison abolition? Now for me, you know, I come from a, strange background in some ways. I grew up in the projects in Chicago. Um, if the police came in our direction, we ran. If we're just plain hopscotch, I don't care what we were doing, we ran because we did not have a positive interaction with police. 
I will always have a scar on my head from the police as a child. And that influences me for the rest of my life. On the other hand, I know that how close I came to being one of those people who was a victim and how close I came to being a victimizer. The first time I got stabbed, I had done nothing to the person who stabbed me. And I carried that anger with me for over 50 years. And it was when I was sitting at a conference on um, mental block, on um, recovering from trauma, that I realized I was a trauma survivor. Been stabbed twice, cut once, shot at a number of times, but that was part of growing up on the south side of Chicago, where I grew up. Everybody had the same basic story or close to it, you know, and I had just watched my cousin on um, YouTube. They had a story about the another project in Chicago, and my brother said, you should watch this video, you get to see your cousin die. Mm -hmm. You know, and I watched the video, and there was my cousin who had been stabbed and died mm -hmm. during the video. And I, I take that all with me, and then my father was a military cop. My older brother was a Chicago police officer for 30 some years, and eventually became a police chief in another town. My brother-in-law was a state trooper in Michigan. My nephew is a cop here in Boston. And so I have both sides of that coming at me. I know that if I had come across the guy who stabbed me, that I probably would have, I, I, I fear what, <laughs> you know, yeah. even 50 years later, I always said that if I saw him and I was with a walker, I tried to chase him down with my walker <laughs> to get him because I had never gotten any Satisfaction, you know, it was so. Now I'm involved in um, restorative justice, and we're trying to create a program of restorative justice. And part of what got me interested in restorative justice were the men up at Norfolk Prison who have a restorative justice program there, not for the people outside, but for themselves and for them to take responsibility and try to um, come to terms with the harm that they've caused. And we're trying to create one in the Boston Public Schools. We have one um, up in Middlesex. We want one in Suffolk. And I think that unless people can feel that justice has been done, mm -hmm. they were doing a video early, what is justice, you know? Unless people feel that they've been treated fairly, whether it's being sent to prison or, um, not having anybody being held accountable for the harm that's been done to you, then we don't have justice. We don't have people feeling um, complete, you know, and um, we have to do that in our society because I know how I felt, mm. how I, um, the second time I got stabbed was an accident. He wasn't trying to stab me, he was stabbing somebody else. I was a counselor trying to protect the other kid and he apologized, he got sick, we had to send him home before me. And that, that was a whole different feeling. Mm -hmm. But the one that I didn't do anything, if I, I know I would have killed him. And I, the, no bottom, no way to get around that, that's how I felt. Sure. You know, and I am glad that I grew up before guns were so available in my community. Uh, although I could make a pretty good zip gun back in the day. Um, <laughs> I understand that it's not just who you are that can put you in prison. It is circumstances that you confront on a day-to-day -day basis. I never valued education. I tried to be a high school dropout, except the assistant principal, Henry Springs, called me and threatened me. <laughs> Thank goodness. Changed all that. So, so it, it sounds like some of the life's experiences and um, levels of personal accountability are things, and this restorative justice approach, are things that uh, police need to take um, into account when they're interacting. Uh, with we have to have people who understand my community right. working in my community. Mm -hmm. People who are not afraid of me. You know, with my boys, I'm the smallest in the group. 
My boy, I had three sons, my two sons and nephew living at home. Six, two, six, five, six, ten. I feared more for them out on the street right. than me. I got a little, I keep this little gray stuff on my face. As someone said earlier, you know, you get that little pass because you're no longer in that group. Well, my nephew gets out of the car and police are intimidated. Sure. And puts him in danger. Mm -hmm. My youngest son is, you know, 250 some pounds. He gets out, he's intimidating. They're all nice young men, college graduates, two teachers out of the group, but nobody knows that. You know, people say, like, even me, I mean, I'm a judge, but when I get pulled over, I grab hold to that steering wheel and feel just as nervous as any other black man because I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know who's coming up on me. Right, right. So let me quit. Reverend Light, what, what, is, what does policing look like in, in a, a system where prisons are abolished? So I think to answer similarly to start, uh, looking at my personal experience, I think my whiteness has a huge impact on how I experience the police. I, for the most part in my life, have never been threatened by police unless I intentionally put myself in a position at a protest where I was trying to cause trouble, uh, that I have never been the target of police violence, that the police have never been taught to go after me. They've never been taught to fear me. They've be never been taught to target me uh, in large because I am a white person. And I come from a family uh, that also has police officers in it. Uh, a lot of my second cousins, all my dad's cousins are cops. Uh, whereas on the, uh, my mom's side, all of the men have been in jail. And so we have, I grew up with two very different perspectives on the police. While I was never the target of police, I grew up with the perspective that police are your family and they're the people that, uh, you know, we had a canine dog come to my eight, eighth birthday uh, that I thought was so great, not thinking about what I know now, the trauma that that can cause for other folks. The generational historical trauma of a police dog coming to a birthday party is such an incredibly white thing to do. Uh, not recognizing and understanding that, right, as a kid. And then on my mom's side of the family who all grew up, you know, poor drug addict family, grew up uh, in the South Street Projects in JP, uh, where, you know, the police were a terrifying force, uh, not because your fear, fear of getting killed or shot, uh, but fear of getting arrested, fear of being harassed, and fear of being locked up. And so I had a sense that, well, my family, that is, because my family did class traveling. Uh, my mom and my dad both class traveled a bit. And so I was never, I grew up in the suburbs of Boston. So the police were not something that I was afraid of. And it was until my incarceration uh, where I had, the first time I ever had a gun pointed at me was from a guard pointing a gun at me. Uh, moving from uh, a prison in Georgia, getting onto a plane to come to a prison in Massachusetts. Uh, and realizing and having a sense of policing that was so very different from what I had been taught before. Uh, and began having conversations with more folks and understanding the history of the police. And I really appreciate uh, Shay and Ayana earlier talking about the history of the police as slave catchers, right? That we have, uh, if you haven't read Our Enemies in Blue, looking at the history of the police, uh, that was really transformative for me, understanding kind of the legacy of police and that as a white person, that whiteness itself is a policing force, that simply my presence can be a policing force to other people, uh, that my presence in black communities brings with it uh, the impact of uh, anxieties around what happens when something happens to me, uh, that, that my presence in ways shapes and changes the behavior of folks around me because of my whiteness as a policing force. And so as someone doing multiracial organizing work, doing anti-racism uh, work, understanding and learning the role that policing has in lots of forms got me understanding that the police as we understand it today is a, a form of control that we need to do something different. That it is, it causes so much harm. The Black Lives Matters movement is the, another iteration of movements that have happened long before the Black Lives Matters movement. That they stand on the shoulders uh, of those who fought and gave their lives, uh, highlighting the violence that the state has been doing to black communities for years and years and generations and generations. Um, 
And so I think in a, when we think about abolition, we do still need to address the fact that harm happens in communities. But police aren't addressing or dealing with that harm authentically. I think as a survivor of sexual violence, one of the things that I was realizing is that I couldn't turn to the police in many ways because they weren't going to do anything. They don't actually have the real resources uh, to make me feel better. Uh, that they weren't the going. The, what's that? Or the training. Or the training. Uh, or that that's their investment. That their investment truly is about protecting, I believe, private property uh, and white supremacy. That, that, see, that is the role of police. And so if I understand that as the role of police, then I can't turn to them to make me feel better when I experience harm. And I can't expect that other folks would be able to do so because of their own experiences with police. And so I, that said, I think on, in the world where abolition happens, harm doesn't disappear. Human beings do, like I said at the beginning, we do bad things to each other. We have the potential to be wonderful and loving, and we have the potential to do terrible things. And so in abolition, we still need accountability. And so you were talking about restorative justice, which I think we'll talk about more, but I think there's lots of different ways in which we need to engage in addressing harm uh, in real ways because police aren't doing it. Uh, and you know, I think, even you know, the crime statistics of what we consider illegal, unless you're killing a white man, uh, other than that, you're more likely to get away with whatever illegal thing you did uh, than you are not. Uh, and so the police aren't actually even addressing what they consider crime, never mind the harms that I see and we consider as the things that are harmful. Uh, they are non-functioning even in the thing that they say they're supposed to do, but they are incredibly functional at surveilling and controlling communities of color, marginalized people. So let's pick up on that, Jason. You um, and, and Judge Harris, you mentioned this as well, this idea of restorative justice. Uh, one would think that whether it's through the reform of the current criminal justice system or the abolition uh, of it as we understand it today, that restorative justice would be a foundational centerpiece uh, of that. Can Jason, can you talk about what that would look like, what is necessary to make it functional? Because you pointed out that harm will still happen, but how can we speak to uh, the need needs of victims, whether it's the need for their feelings of safety or their need for healing or even in some instances their need for revenge. And, and what happens when victims don't want to participate in this restorative justice process? Absolutely. I think I actually, the term restorative justice has been, uh, I think, very well critiqued uh, by folks, uh, specifically the organization that is of interest to me is Generation 5, which is an organization of su adult survivors of child sexual abuse. Uh, and they say that restore we can't restore justice where there wasn't justice already. Uh, and in so many of these situations where harm happens, there wasn't justice there. So we can't restore it. So they talk about transformative justice. And they offer us not just circles where we have survivors or victims of harm or those who have been impacted and the person who has caused harm uh, in the same space because that can actually be an incredibly traumatic experience. That being present in the same space as the person who hurt you is not necessarily a healing or transformative experience for many people who have survived harm. Uh, and so instead they say that first with uh, transformative justice we need to make sure we're doing survivor-centered work uh, where people who are survivors of harm, the first thing that is happening is we are making sure they have all of the things that they need to heal, that they are having a break from work if that's what they need, that they are having full support of community members, that they're having therapeutic support and care, that they are having medical care that they need, that they're having meals provided for them, that their travel is taken care of to wherever they need to go, that the resources and time that we uh, have need to be first and foremost focused on survivor healing and care. Secondly, from there, we actually need to look at the community where that harm happened in the first place. Because again, this is an organization focused on uh, child sexual abuse, and what they say is that in essentially every circumstance of child sexual abuse, there were other adults that knew what was happening and didn't do anything. And they didn't do anything for a lot of reasons, many of them because the other adult uh, who saw what was happening didn't feel that they had the power to do something, or uh, that the partner, the person who was causing the harm was the person who had resources in the family. So let's say it was a husband abusing their child and a wife who is living in the home 
does not have, did not have access to a job, so the person who is being abusive controls the money, controls the rent, controls the home, and maybe there are other children there too, and not knowing what to do. So the, the second thing that Generation 5 looks at is saying that we need to make sure communities have the resources they need to be active bystanders instead of passive bystanders, where we are learning how to engage when violence is happening and know what to do, that we have the resources and support necessary to make it so violence isn't happening, and the survivors who experienced harm while we did nothing who might be angry at us as bystanders have the space also to confront us as well. That's not only confronting the person who caused harm, but often also confronting the people who did nothing. Uh, and then a third piece, obviously and essential, is that holding the person who caused harm accountable. And that's having another circle that has a sense that that person has value and that it is people who care about that person are part of this process. Uh, that they are held accountable in lots, <clears throat> excuse me, lots of different ways. Uh, examples have been given by Creative Interventions is an amazing organization uh, that was, was based in New York City that gives many options around uh, transformative justice. There's a book, uh, The Revolution Starts at Home, looking at uh, transformative justice models. But one of the key things that is almost always present is that the survivors of harm have a list of demands of what they need from the person who caused harm in the first place. Uh, and that part of the circle around the person who caused harm is ensuring that they meet those demands. And is that you can't go to certain spaces that you used to go to before because that's where the survivor goes and you need to stay away from them. You need to shop in a different store to get your groceries so that that person doesn't have to run into you. You need to enroll in a different university because things need to be done differently. And that it's making sure that that person has the ability to do those things and is supported in doing them uh, and not demonized for only being uh, a person who caused harm. That they're more than that. That, uh, that pe the people who care about them are holding them accountable in part because they know you did something wrong, you caused harm to somebody else, and yet I know you have the potential to be better than that. I know you are not only that thing. And that because I care about you, I want to be in this process with you. And so I think that that's you know, kind of a model that isn't, it can't be seen as a one size fits all. I think that's one of the biggest things that our criminal legal system does that is particularly egregious, is this idea that all forms of harm can be addressed with the same way of dealing with things. Mm -hmm. Uh, transformative justice needs to be unique to essentially every instance of harm. There can be many tools that are available for folks for us to do that. And just a real quick piece on revenge. Revenge and vengeance are very important feelings. They are very powerful feelings. For survivors of harm, vengeance and revenge are beautiful fantasies and they need to stay fantasies. And that's one of the things about uh, transformative justice that I think recognizes that for those of us who have experienced harm, that we need to be able to have space where we talk about hurting the person who hurt us. We need to be able to write stories about that. We need to be able to make art about that. We need to be able to yell and scream about that. And then our community needs to be strong enough to remind us that that's not what we're actually going to do. Our community needs to be strong enough to say, we have values greater than that, and we hold your pain and anger and anguish, and we see that as holy in a religious sense, and we see that as something that is valuable to your healing, and we're not going to follow through on that. When we think about survivor accountability and we're following what survivors say, if the survivor tells you, I want you to go and stab the person who did this to me, we have values as a community in transformative justice that says, Let's hold that as a vengeance fantasy, and let's be in that and feel that, and let's work through it and go through somewhere else, and figuring out ways to do that together. Judge Harris, what is some of the work that you're currently engaged in, and what is First necessary? First I could listen to him all day. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, with our, we have a program called Our Restorative Justice um, in the school that we're trying to have in the school system in Suffolk County, and we're just now breaking few doors down to get that. One of the realities is that most of the children who came in front of me in court came from schools, from incidents at school, not from the community, not from being out 
either coming to school or going home from school or being in school is when we got them in court. And most of them didn't belong in the court. Mm -hmm. Most of them should have been should have been treated in the school for what it was, being a kid. Mm -hmm. If I were growing up now, I'd have a long record. Mm -hmm. And I know that because my mother had to come up to school two or three times a week because of my behavior, which, which is a reality. But that same behavior now gets you brought to court. And that frightens me because we're criminalizing children um, from the age of seven, eight years old up for being children. And we've got to stop that. And there, there's so many things that we could do differently that we would save money on, would make a difference in society, but the people who are profiting off of this would not profit off of it. You know, right now, the big whole thing about marijuana, you know how many young people I defended mm -hmm. around drugs? And now the same people, one of them was a prosecutor, is now talking about opening up a dispensary? To, that's, that's so offensive to me. Yep. I mean, I believe in all drugs being, all organic drugs being legalized. I need to get that out. Um, and so at the drugstore, you know, I don't think mm -hmm. a judge should be able to use drugs and sit up and make decisions about people's lives or a police officer, or the pilot that I had to fly with yesterday. Mm -hmm. you know. But if you want to have that opportunity, get your drug card and go to the drugstore. But we don't do that. you know. Now that it's affecting people other than those folks in my community, mm -hmm. I live in Roxbury, now it's a medical issue. Right, right. Mm -hmm. public health issue. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I don't disagree with that, but it should be retroactive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And we should go back and clean up all those young people I had to represent. Where's Marty? Mm -hmm. yeah. All those folks we fought for over at Roxbury Defenders and, and committee, clean their records. Mm -hmm. Take it off because it was a medical issue and we failed to recognize it. Yep. Yep. Okay, so now I got that out my system. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I, I just think there's so many. I'm working with a young man who was creating the thing called the People's Academy. When we were talking about education in the prisons, I wasn't talking about just reading, writing, and arithmetic, because not all of us are going to do well in that. Right. I have young people who talk about they want to be um, auto mechanics or music producers. Well, you know, when I was growing up, you cleaned the carburetor, you know, cleaned the butterfly veil, and you were gone, you know? <laughs> now you got to have a computer degree to work on cars. Mm -hmm. You're going to be a music producer and can't read music because we don't have music in the schools? That doesn't work. Mm. You know, so what I'm talking about is giving people in prison and in our schools the education that fits them. You know, I mean, some of us love, I love books. You know, I still have to have the paper in my hand right. um, because I love books. But not everyone is going to do that. So we need to give, even within our prisons, an opportunity for people to grow. We talk about rehabilitation. And one of the guys in prison told me, I was never habilitated. So how are you going to rehabilitate me? Uh -huh. you know, and that's so true. We have to talk about building from the ground up sometimes with some of the people and young people that we work with. And if we're not willing to do that, then we have to talk about getting out of the game, mm. okay? And then we have to talk about abolishing a system that perpetuates what we've always been doing. Right. You know, and I believe we can transform because, see, again, I've been a victim. And I could have been the person out committing that harm so easily. One of the guys who I had a big confrontation with, a guy named Thunder, um, that was his street name. Um, if the police and my father hadn't gotten, I don't know what would have happened. But Thunder ended up doing 30-some years in prison, as did two of his brothers, each for murder, separate murders. Thunder came out. His younger brother came to Boston. I met, saw him years ago. Thunder apparently is someplace here in Boston and is an accomplished artist. Mm -hmm. wow. Well, 
why didn't we start that when we were young? That skill right. that he had, maybe his victim would still be alive. You know, if we had recognized his talents in school and nurtured those talents. I have, when I taught third and fourth grade, and most third grade teachers can tell you which kids are going to make it and which kids are not in our system as it is now established. A third grade teacher can tell you this, and if they can tell you, shouldn't we have to be able to do something to change the outcome? Right. If we know what the problem is. So from that point, we've got 10 minutes left, and I want to make sure we get to some questions in the audience. If you all could briefly, one minute each, say one or two things people here can do when they leave this place to further either this movement or this conversation about abolition or, and or reform, and what are some resources that are available? One uh, minute. I would say first thing to start with is if you don't have a relationship right now with somebody who's locked up, you should change that. There's no reason everybody in this room shouldn't be writing to somebody who's in prison. Uh, and that you should tell the other people in your life to do so as well. Black and Pink, we have 8,000 prisoners looking for people to write to. So you can use us as a resource for that. I think that's one of the first things. To try on the idea of abolition. If you're not an abolitionist, try it on anyway. Try on uh, seeing what are ideas you can think of that we would do differently? Because our criminal legal system already isn't addressing things like murder for everybody. Not everybody who kills somebody gets held accountable for it. Uh, certainly 14 out of 15 people, according to the FBI, who rape someone will never spend a day in jail. So we're not addressing these things that we often talk about as like prisons keep us safe from this. They don't. So try on abolition. See what it would feel like to come up with something else. If the ideas of transformative justice I suggested aren't exciting to you, there are so many other things. Uh, Creativeinterventions.org is a huge one. Insight Women of Color Against Violence have had uh, lots of important conversations and critiques around abolition for saying that we don't have enough uh, answers. And so there are more answers that have been coming, both from uh, the Creative Interventions is mostly women of color organizers, and then the book The Revolution Starts at Home uh, are big things. So I would start there. Try it on. See how we can build this together. And for me, mentoring is a very important Mentor someone other than your own child. Mm. Okay, uh, my wife and I have a young man who's in prison, and for him, mentoring also means send him a few bucks. Mm -hmm. You know, we can. He's in prison. Nobody else in his life is able to send him anything while he's in prison. And if you can, visit him mm -hmm. or that person who's in prison. But pick up a child who's young and be their lifelong mentor. I, one of the things I love is that I see my mentors all over, all over the justice system doing wonderful things. And sometimes you mentor someone when you don't even know it, you know, about a little thing that you did, and they feel they have to pay it back. Um, I got a story, but I won't tell it here. Um, one of the things I... I, I believe is that we don't give up on people. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in throwaways. Mm -hmm. And I know it's easy when someone has done a horrific crime to say, throw them away. I don't believe in the death penalty because we make too many mistakes. And until we get to a point where we can bring them back, we shouldn't be able to take them out. All right, and let's give, oh. <laughs> okay, let's give our panelists a hand. <laughs> And, and I think I'm going to try to squeeze in at least two questions. So if we have uh, any questions from anybody, we will take them now. Oh, we got a mic, so you got to walk to it. All right. Yeah, right. Well, for those who aren't uh, able, if you can just raise your hand, and we'll make sure the mic gets to you. I just broke the mic, but <laughs> yeah, that's what for I some reason that doesn't surprise me, Monty. Because I'm a troublemaker, right? Um, well, anyway, um, uh, first of all, I appreciate very much what all of you have said. And uh, I have one quick comment to uh, Reverend Lydon to check out Susan Jacoby's 1983 book about re revenge, okay. called Wild Justice. It's out of print, but it's just amazing. Okay. Um, on the question that Rasan po posed about opportunities, um, I want to alert people. I'm, I've been on the Mass Sentencing Commission for two years now. and. 
We're going to have our next public hearing October 19th, and there'll soon be a public notice with specific questions that we've been working very hard on for two years. And I'm hoping if you go to the Mass Government website, Mass Sentencing Commission, it'll be posted soon. We're still finalizing the specific questions. They're, they're pretty broad questions, like safety valve for mandatory minimums. Uh, and we would, I would certainly encourage the broadest possible uh, input. Along those lines, I just want to focus that in one way, which is to say, what's happened here today is a wonderful reflection of what I've seen since 2010, when the Corey bill, which was flawed, uh, passed through. But what it did was generate a grassroots movement in, in favor of criminal justice reform and racial justice, which I've never seen in the 40 years that I've been doing this work. So it was a big breakthrough in that regard, and many of you are part of that. Um, what I think is missing in that movement is a focus on what exactly should be done. Um, and as much as I favor abolition, there are opportunities to do things in the next year because of the Council for State Government process that's going on, which I have limited uh, confidence they'll do a lot, but they will come up with numbers that we can use to say channel resources from wasted incarceration to crime prevention and public safety in communities. So I hope people will look at the specific questions that are going to be posed and come in and give some very hard-hitting comments on the answers. We're up against a monolith, which is the district attorneys. They have the ear of the Speaker of the House and the Governor. So it's going to take a lot of work on all your part and all our part to get some good things done. Thank you. Thank Sorry you. That was so long. All right. Um, so I don't know that there's a question. Well, I wanted but, to get oh, one you, more you thing wanted out. To, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I grew up question. during the civil rights movement. Um, and I just want to say to those folks, and I see your shirt, Black Lives Matter, for those young people who are involved, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for picking it up and taking it to the next level. Um, because, yeah, because. Because. <laughs> yes. that, that's how the kids say it. Because, yeah. So, if there are no other questions at this time, again, join me in uh, giving our panelists a round of applause. And thank you all for being here.